And I'm actually going to come down. I'm going to mess up Joe's shot. Speaking of pieces of music that brings memories to our life, there are times where pieces of music bring you joy and laughter. They give you nostalgia from when you were a young person, or maybe you were listening to something with grandma and grandpa, and they'd, they'd break out the record player. Me and Vanessa break out our record player for our kids every now and then, and uh, they, they say, let's put on the dancing music, because they know that when, when the records like that come on, it's usually a little bit uh, older, like a Stevie Wonder or a Frank Sinatra, so they know that they're going to move when they hear those things. So for me, not only did I think of I Surrender All and all of that, but there is one particular song, and uh, I'm going to put you guys on the fly up there. We're going to put the podium mic on. Thank you. There's one song that any time that I think of it, it makes me laugh. See if you guys... All right, I'm not going to get copyright stricken. Because YouTube will be like, we recognize that song. But anytime that I hear that melody, I think of the movie White Chicks with the Wayans Brothers. And I think of the scene where Terry Crews, this big 275 uh, pound bodybuilding African American man, gets up and he starts moving like a, like a schoolgirl. He's like, I love this song. And all of a sudden, this big hul hulking man uh, seems way out of character, out of one simple piece of music. So every time that I hear that melody, it makes me laugh. There are some times where songs like I Surrender All will make me cry and make me feel sorrowful because it reminds me of where I need to be with my relationship with Jesus. But a melody does many things to us. So today, we are talking about the melody of the Old Testament. Genesis 1 through 11. If you have your Bibles this morning, turn with me to Genesis chapter 1. While you guys are turning there, I'm going to give you guys some personal announcements that uh, I received this week. Uh, for those of you who have been asking about Mary Chinkata Sunday School class, it is now available for both men and women. So they are starting in the book of Judges, so any brave young men who are looking to learn in God's word, please join the class. Please, let it not just be Eric. <laughs> um, also, some major needs that uh, was told to me during the week was our uh, kids ministry. We need some, uh, some more workers, some more adults to be able to help out with our kids, especially my own. Please pray for me and my wife, because they... Uh, they like, to move, they like to escape <laughs> uh, different things, as well as our new usher and greeting team. If anybody has noticed, Angel and Maritza have been out in the front handing out the outlines, and we appreciate them for stepping up and doing that. And our AV team as well. We're looking to help out in our AV team, and for those of you who like that behind-the-scenes work, where, you know, they don't like to be recognized uh, uh, except, you know, doing the gifts that God has, has blessed them with, please make yourself available. We always need many hands. But some people ask the question, Pastor, how can I get involved? I don't know how to be able to start the process. Well, starting on March 5th, we are going to have a new class called Starting Point. So Starting Point is our new class. It is the introduction to ministry and membership. So if you're looking to become a member here at Bethel or you're looking to be able to get involved, that is going to be the class that you are going to take. And it is taught by a, a very debonair Spanish man. He's, he's very handsome. He likes to wear maroon in a blazer on a Sunday morning. I don't, there's just something about him. <laughs> no. So, Genesis 1. In the beginning of this melody, we're going to be going through the entire creation narrative. 
because that is the intro to this melody. God in his seven-day creation does something masterful and wonderful. Now, I know what I normally do with you guys. I normally read our text in the beginning. I'm not going to do that this time because there's 36 verses. So this is what we're going to do. Every time that we go through a point, we'll do a little bit at a time so that it won't be so overwhelming, okay? But the big thing that I want you guys to concentrate on is this, is God's creation story models how we are to grow. God's creation story models how we are to grow as individuals and as a church. Would you bow your heads and hearts with me in a word of prayer? Father God, in the name of Jesus, we come before you, and I thank you so much for the extended time of praise and worship we had this morning. It lets us know that your spirit is in this place, and everything that you want to do matters to us, Lord. So as we start from the beginning, as we go through the melody, Lord, paint a picture with this song and help us to understand it even more. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. The book of Genesis is the first book of the Torah, or what we would call the Pentateuch. It is the first of the five books of Moses, the Jewish law. Moses is credited with the authorship, and God does two things. What he does is that he gives Moses the words through the Holy Spirit, and then he also uses his, Moses' lens and worldview to be able to paint a picture for his modern-day audience. One of the things that we have to pay attention to is that God very seldomly gave somebody a picture that they could not understand. At the end of the Bible, in the book of Revelation, there were so many images that were happening to the Apostle John, he really couldn't be able to make sense of it, and he tried to write it down as best as he could. So with Moses, in the beginning, when starting those basics, he used Moses' worldview and his concept of the world in that context. That's why Moses doesn't say anything about a universe or anything besides the planet that he is on. Because that's all that he knows. He only knows the sky above, the stars, the sun, the moon, and the ground. So we need to think in that way. Genesis is broken up into two major sections. Primeval history, which is 1 through 11, that's what we're going through. And Israel's origin story. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Now, we're only going to be going through chapters 1 through 11 in this series. But the purpose of this is to be able to explain the beginnings of creation, to explain the downfall of mankind, to explain God's relationship with imperfect human advocates, and to preview God's plan of salvation. That is what the book of Genesis is supposed to shape to us in God's story. And it starts off with Genesis 1, 1 and 2. If you read it with me, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was hovering over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. That verse 1 is basically a prologue sentence. It's a main idea of what the next chapter is supposed to give to us. It explains what is going to happen in verses 1 through 3 to 2 to 3. Our chapter and verses make sense to us, but to an Israelite, there were certain cues that you had to read and repetitions and patterns to be able to pick up when the next section would start. So this is basically how the modern day translation would go. Hey! I'm going to tell you how God created the heavens and the earth. That's verse 1. And then we would say, once upon a time, the earth was formless and void. To give you that context of how we're supposed to understand. 
Verse 2 talks about a pre-creation state. It talks about the land being formless and empty, or desolate emptiness, a depiction of a desert wasteland where there is no water, there is no life. And then they talk about the water. The water itself was the deep abyss, or darkness. So much darkness that it was considered chaotic ocean water. In the ancient Near East, to go into the ocean was to provoke death because there was no way to sustain life in the ocean water. So the first setting is a globe that has chaotic ocean water, and that is supposed to depict what happens without God. When God's presence is not present, there's nothing but chaos. But then it brings you on. It talks to you about this chaotic ocean water. And the word that we use in the original language is called to home. But when the Spirit of God steps on the scene, it says that he moves over the face of the deep, or he hovers above the waters. And suddenly, that word to home, that chaotic ocean water, is now neutral, life-giving water. It changes words to recognize that God is here. In other words, when God steps onto the scene, chaos is nullified. Oh, y'all not awake this morning. When God's presence steps onto the scene, there is no point of chaos. It can't function. So Moses is painting a picture that everything needs to have God's presence and his spirit. And for us to, for you to be able to get a better intake of what God's spirit does and how it interacts in the first portion of the Bible, join us for Wednesday night Bible study. We had a very good time uh, with the discussion and we're actually focusing on the spirit of God in Genesis 1 through 11. So cheap plug right there. <laughs> now, reminder, we live in a 21st century, Western, modern technology world, and sometimes we put our worldview into scripture rather than letting it speak for itself. So when we say in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, I remember for many, many years, I used to think of the planets, the solar system, and everything. And that's true. But remember, Moses doesn't understand that. Moses only understands the ground, the water, the mountains, the sky, the stars, and how he sees everything. To him, the world is flat. That's an odd concept for us. For him, there is an end to the earth. So it makes sense when the authors write in that way. So we need to understand that. Remember, God's creation story models how we are to grow as individuals and as a church. The first thing that he gives is form. Genesis 1, 3. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good and separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be a vault between the waters to separate the water from water. So God made a vault to separate the water under the vault from the water above it, and it was so. God called the vault sky, and there was evening, and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered into one place and let the dry ground appear, and it was so. God called the dry ground land, and the waters he had gathered he had called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it according to its various kind, and it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kind, and trees 
bearing fruit with seed in it according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the third day. Day one. God creates time. I know that we don't think of it that way, but that's exactly what he did. Because before that, there was no concept of it. He is the beginning, and he is the end. So the first thing that he needs was, I need a timeline. I need it to happen. And the first words of God is, let there be light. Many people have come up to me and said, Pastor, where is Jesus in the creation narrative? He is in those words. Let there be light. Let me paint a picture for you, okay? John 1, 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. Remember that Jesus Christ is the physical expression of God. So any time that God speaks before Jesus becomes flesh, that's Jesus. He is the word coming out of God's mouth. He is the physical manifestation of life and growth happening. Day one. And the evidence of that? There was evening and there was morning. Day two. God creates a vault or a sky dome. Remember, we're using Moses' words. So that vault, that sky dome is called rakia. In the King James, we called it a firmament. And some people get tripped up. They're like, what, is, what does that mean? Well, in the ancient Near East, they believed that to separate the heavens and the water that produce rain from the water that was underneath, there was a hard glass-like seal that kept it closed. And that God, when wanting to give life, would break those heavens open to let water go through it. That is why it says, the water above from the water below. And the water below is not just the ocean water, but when it comes up and it is fresh water, it is rivers. And that is what made sense to 4,000 year ago Hebrew. And a Semitic people like the Babylonians, the Assyrians, and the Egyptians. It was the way that God protected them from the sky cracking and water coming out. Now in a couple of chapters we're going to talk about that sky cracking with the flood. And how God goes back to a pre-creation state and creates the Tahom again with the water. Remember, Moses doesn't know the universe that you and I know. He doesn't know that the earth is round. He doesn't know anything besides what he sees. So he is writing to an audience that understands his concepts. And that's why sometimes we can't understand things in Scripture with our pastors or our teachers or our mentors or Bible studies or even a study Bible. Scripture was made with people in mind that would understand it. So some people say, well, Pastor Thomas, does that mean that the Bible is moot with certain points? No, because there are things called universal truths the Bible says that there is nothing new under the sun, so we have everything in this context for a reason. God is taking an ancient document filled with his spirit and making it applicable to us in our modern day. Only he could be able to do something like that. I'm going to go off on a tangent. I'm not on my notes anymore. The Iliad is a thousand years from the copy that we currently have to when it was written. Same thing with the Odyssey. The Bible is 50 years away from when John passed away, and yet we have critics about ours and not about theirs. No. God is doing something in his word and has been doing it since he spoke. 
Day three, God creates seas, land, and food. Praise God. Can't wait until we break today. <laughs> the separation of land and sea was necessary for life to begin in both areas. Land for the animals and mankind, and water for the fish and water mammals. The trees with fruit, notice that there is no fresh water yet because... We don't need it. There's no salt water yet. It's just water because God is causing the growth. Later on in chapter 2, it says that there was not even rain within the first couple chapters of the Bible, but that pools of water would spring up and wet the ground. That was God's original intention in his creation. God is giving form in this raw material. And look at another portion in scripture. When Job comes up. Can we have that picture? When Job is on the scene. And he starts questioning his life. And he's getting this advice from other people. God comes in a tornado or in a great cloud and wind. And he says, you want to know what? You want to call me out? Let me call you out. And let me ask you some questions. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you understand. Who marked out its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? And who laid its cornerstones? God is questioning man because there's so many times where we question God. So he pointed it back to them this time around. And it gives us it gives us an understanding that the fear of the Lord, you can be able to respect him and he can be able to respect you. But if you start disrespecting him, oh, he'll call you out on it. And the psalmist, when he's talking about God and, and the creation, in Psalm 33, 6 and 9, it says this, By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. Their starry hosts by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the seas into jars. He puts them into deep store houses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him, for he spoke and it came to be. He commanded it and it stood firm. He, out of the raw material, he formed something. In every other creation narrative, that happens on this earth, you have a God that forms out of nothing that has to birth other demigods in order for creation to take place. And God just steps on the scene in the second line of scripture and says, no, it's just me. And I'm just going to say it and it's going to happen. I don't need no other God. I don't need no other advocate. I don't need to do anything like that, but just say light, land, sky, air. I think about my iPhone, okay? In this iPhone, there are years and years and years of technology and hardware, and there came a phase where this was drafted up, that the raw material had to have a concept, it had to have a rough draft, it had to go through many phases to make sure that it was working and it was operational. And then you got a final draft that you can put out as a product to the people. That is what man does with raw forms and ideas. How great is our God that he just had to say it? He just had to say it, guys. And it was perfect. What a novel concept. Nick, lights. No. <laughs> I wish. I wish I could be able to say something and it just be done. No, we have to go through a process and go through all of those things. And yet God created the planets, the solar systems, everything that we see in the Hubble telescope. He said it and it was perfect. How amazing is that? Are we ready to give God our raw material as individuals and in this church and see what he can form out of it? So not only did God give form, 
He filled it. He gave filling. Form and filling. Okay? The last three days of Genesis 1 are filling this new form of the earth. Starting in uh, verse 14, it says, And God said, Let there be light in the vault to separate the day from the night, and let them serve as a sign to mark sacred times, days, and years, and let them be lights in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights to govern the day and the lesser to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night, and to separate the light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, let the water teem with living creatures and let the birds fly above the earth across the vault of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea and every living thing with which the water teems and that moves about in it according to their kind and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good and God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply in number and fill the water in the seas and let the birds increase on the earth. And there was evening And there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, let the land produce creatures according to their kind, the livestock, the creatures that move along the ground, and the wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kind, the livestock according to their kind, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kind. And it was so. I'm going to pause right there. I know that there's a little bit more filling. We're going to pause right there. Okay? Day four. God creates the sun, the moon, and the stars. So we have a concept of time on day one. And God says, this is a great form, but I need something to be able to give it recognition. In the ancient Near East, if you did not have a form and a function, you technically didn't exist. So you could have a water bottle, but if it didn't have a purpose, then it didn't exist. That was their limited concept of something. So God would create time, but he needed something to be able to fill that time with. The sun for the day, the moon for the night, and the purposes was to be able to divide the day that we know, the signs of sacred times, like holidays, the seasons of rest, according to Exodus 23, 11, and the year of jubilee, like Leviticus 25 tells us. To govern and to rule, it means to have dominion over the day. Now, we're going to talk about that word dominion a little bit later on in our next point. Day five, he creates the sea and the sky creatures, the fish, the mammals, the great sea creatures, the ones that we know like the giant squid, and the ones that we get a small depiction of like the Leviathan in the Psalms and in Job 40 and 41. And the great winged creatures, the eagles, the hawks, the blue jays, and the robins, more than we can ever imagine. And there was no predators yet. None of these were predators, because in God's world, there was no food chain. There was no circle of life. They all ate the grass and the leaves. They were all herbivores before imperfection came in. And he blesses them. He says, be fruitful and multiply. It is the first time that we ever see God's blessing in Scripture. Production and multiplication is the first command to all creatures in Scripture, not just mankind. In fact, if you look in the original language, it talks about um, how the sky, sea, and land creatures have a nephesh, or what we know as a soul. We call it a soul. 
in the translation it says every moving living creature so it lets you know that everything on this earth has the breath of life everything on this earth not just mankind just like in the new creation we'll have these same animals they'll be around now i don't know about every dog going to heaven everybody praying for their cat right now maybe maybe god is is nice in that way but what I do know is that these same animals, even the ones that are extinct to us and we only see their bones, are going to have a place in heaven because God created them and he created them to be good. And in day six, the first part, he fills it with the land animals. He fills it with the wild animals. These are ones that are non-domesticated like our lions and tigers and bears. I was waiting for it. <laughs> our livestock, the soon-to-be-domesticated uh, animals, and the creeping things like the insect and the snake and the lizards and everything that people are like, Satan must have invented that. No, because back then they didn't have these imperfections. We don't like them now. <laughs> but they didn't have imperfections back then. They weren't doing what they were doing to creep us out. Days four through six gives us a thorough list from the water to the sky to even the three degrees of the earth of how God wanted to fill his creation. He wanted life to be able to begin because he is a God of life. He's not a God that destroys. He's not a God that breaks. And God creates everything to be good. It is only due to the corruption of mankind and the introduction to sin in the world, that the good thing gets corrupted and broken down. With God, all things are possible, all things grow, and all things have life. Without God, help us. Help us, God. The psalmist goes on in Psalm 74 to speak about the different seasons that God has blessed us with. In verse 16 it says, The day is yours, and yours is also the night. You established the sun, the moon, and it was you who set the boundaries of the earth. You made both summer and winter. We experienced that yesterday. I have to have a contemplation with God because I don't know if that was really of him because it was too cold. I was not made for that, okay? And God filling the waters with the giant sea creatures. It says this in Psalm 104. It says this, How many are your works, Lord? In wisdom you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. There is the sea, vast and spacious, teeming with every creature beyond number, living things both large and small. There are the ships, Go to and fro, and the Leviathan, which you formed to frolic there. When I think of God filling, when I think of God like growing and moving forward, I think of the difference between stagnant water and running water. Stagnant water is, is, is a pool of water, and if you see in, in Israel, they have these things called cisterns that they are man-made wells that they have dug in and they are miles and miles sometimes wide and big because they collect water in a desert wasteland. But it stays there. So after it rains, it collects in there and it just stays there. Months. What happens after a couple days when water is left out? We get freaked out. We're like, I'm changing this water, I'm washing this cup, <laughs> I'm saying a prayer, because I don't want any of that bacteria to infect me and get me sick. If God had never filled the form, it would just be stagnant water. It'd just be a globe that would be going into chaos. The second law of thermodynamics says that once something has been made new, it can do nothing but break down from that point. It can never be restored to its original. It can only be restored to make it look like it. But running water, running water like a river that flows is constantly purifying itself. 
It's making itself new and clean. And God wants to fill not only this earth, but you and me with living water. He said it in John 4. He wants to constantly renew us. He wants our cup to overflow, as the psalmist says. And he wants to make us new every single day of our lives. We will never, in God, have any bacteria, temptation, or sin in us. God doesn't cause that. The book of James shows us that God doesn't cause that. But every man and woman, when they are tempted, bring that to themselves. Again, the corruption of the good thing that God has created. So God has given us a form, a raw material that is now made into something good. And then he gives us a filling or a function to be able to give us purpose and to enact the thing that he wants. We must always be looking for God's filling. There is no point in surrendering the raw material that you have without being able to fulfill a purpose. And that does not count for us as individuals. It counts for this church as well. There is no point in filling this church with bodies if we don't have a purpose. God wants to fill us with his spirit, with his plans, with his purposes. But are we ready, church? Are we ready to be filled by God in order that he might accomplish his plans. God's given us a form. God's filled us. He's given us function and purpose. But the best thing that he gave, the best thing that he introduced during this creation narrative was the family. The conclusion of God's creation comes at the establishment of the family. Genesis 1, 26, read with me. Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over all the livestock and all the wild animals and over the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has breath has the breath of life in it. I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw that all he had made and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus, the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. God gives form, God gives function, God gives a family. He says, let us make mankind in our image. God wanted a reflection of who he was to rule the earth. That's why a dog or a cat couldn't do it. Because God made man to be able to appear as he was in the heavenly realm. God was spirit, and yet he already knew how he was going to form us and how he was going to shape us. And the purpose was that we could rule. Remember, the blessing was to be fruitful and multiply. But we have another part. We are to, uh, supposed to have dominion. We are supposed to have dominion over the birds, over the fish, over the animals. We are supposed to rule because God is a ruler. So why would his image not reflect us ruling as well? 
This is what separates us from all the other creatures. This is why we have a conscience. We all have God's blessing to multiply, but his mirror image has been called to oversee it. He gives instructions. He says he gives us every plant to eat for food and every seed-bearing plant for food as well. And everybody was a vegan. Ugh. I enjoy the later portions of scripture where, you know, there's a penil out there, right? Praise God. <laughs> Thank you, God, for, for the extra things in life. But the results was that it was very good. It not only was, was good, everything else was good, but it was very good. In the six-day creation, there's only one other time that God either does a double blessing or he adds an emphasis on something. It's when he separates the land and the seas and when he adds fruit onto the earth. It's the only time that he says good on the same day twice. But this is the only time where he adds the descriptor of very good. It's with the forming of mankind. I didn't say man. I said mankind. Thank God for our females. We would be lost without you. I don't know where my wife is. She's probably out there. <laughs> Let her know that I said that. <laughs> but the psalmist reflects on man's authority. This is what he says. He says in Psalm 8, When I consider the work of your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of him? Human beings that you care for them. You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. I was looking for a good illustration to be able to reflect how God sees the family and how it is important. And it was very simple because God sees himself as a father. So parents and children are very easy for me to understand. God puts you in your child's life because you are what they need to be able to survive in this world. And it is our responsibility, it is our responsibility not to give them the wreck that we came from, but to be able to say there was a better way and I found it. And I might be imperfect giving it to you, but I'm gonna try my best. I see the little, the little uh, grins and the little uh, things that my boys do. And I recognize that from when I was taking care of my brother and my sister. I'm the oldest of seven kids. So I've seen a lot of little things in my kids that remind me of my brothers and my sisters. And I can only see how much God sees. Because if I look at them with love and grace and sometimes wrath, <laughs> how much more innocently does God see us now that we are a part of his family? And how much more sorrowful is he when we're not a part of his family? How much more does his heart break because he wants to hold us and I understand that we live in a generation of absent fathers, but let me tell you, when God is your father, he will wipe away every tear. He will take away every sorrow. And the imperfections that were in man are not in him. He will complete your brokenness and you will be completely healed. No amount of trauma can be able to stay with you because your father has you in his lap. Hallelujah. How wonderful and great is our God. God wants to fill us with his goodness, with his hope, with his love, with his strength, with his courage. Most importantly, with his salvation. He bought us. He, he took away our debt and he bought us back when we were marred when we were broken, 
when we were hurting, when we were dying, and he said, you're worthy. When all society would be able to say, absolutely not, he said, you're worthy because I've made you worthy. I'm calling you back to be a new creation. Jasmine, Jamie, would you come? We've talked about what God did through his creation. But we have to make it applicable in our own life and in this church. If there is not application to the word of God, if we cannot go out and successfully use it, then we're just a bunch of fatted calves. It's true. So if I accumulate all this knowledge and I don't go out and try to reach out to people and say, man, I've got good news. I'm wasting it. This Sunday is Vision Sunday. And over the last two months, I've prayed and I've fasted for this church. Because I didn't know what God's vision was for this place when I got here. I just knew he called me to go. I just knew he called me to go. But during these last two months and during the prayer and fasting with you guys and uh, speaking to the deacons about the good things that God were doing, there were times where I was stirring up in the middle of the night saying, God, what are you trying to say? What are you trying to do with the raw material that Bethel has? Because I can't give it form. I can't give it a function. We can be able to make it a family, but you have to give me the first two things. Because it doesn't make sense if I do it. If I do it, it's broken. If I do it, it's broken. But if God does it, it'll grow. It'll grow. And it'll multiply. So what were we before? This church at one point was filled with people. I've seen old pictures where the second floor was completely open. And not only were these pews filled, but there was stadium theater seating where it was filled as well. And the choir pit was also filled. We're talking 400 people in this church, all hearing and growing in God and in his mercy and in his majesty. And at some point, that growth paused. I don't know what happened, nor am I here to criticize the men of God and the women of God who were a part of the leadership during that pause. Because without th that happening, without that result, I would not be here. I wouldn't. But I thank God for the opportunity to be able to be here with you. But when I look at it, and when I ask and pray about these pauses, it makes me think, have we forgotten our purpose? So here's our purpose, ladies and gentlemen. Form. God in the first three days creation, out of raw material, created something beautiful, wonderful, and perfect. And in that same way, later on, 2,000 years ago, he took 120 people that were raw, but that were on fire for God, that were interceding and praying for 50 days, not knowing what was going to happen to them. Their savior had gone up to heaven, but he brought something down, very great. We call it the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And in that upper room, God gave this form and he called it the church. And then there was filling. God created this planet in days four through six and filled it with everything that it would need to be successful, to grow and to multiply. A perfect form and filling. In that same way, God took the church and gave it a purpose, gave it a function, gave it a filling, and he said, go out to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the other ends of the earth. And then he gave a family. God establishes mankind to be his representatives on earth, to have authority over all creation and to subdue it. 
And in the same way that 120 people were given the command to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So what is our purpose, Bethel? What is our form? God wants to take the raw material that we have here in this church, our gifts, our talents, our brokenness, our hurts, our hang-ups, our habits, our stories and our testimonies, and turn it into a soul-winning church for Jesus Christ. How does he want to fill it? He wants Bethel Assembly of God filled with the Holy Spirit and power so that we can be witnesses in Forest Hill, in Newark, in Essex County, in New Jersey, and to the ends of the earth through missions and evangelism. And how does he want to make it a family? God has established his church. This church to be representatives in this city, to have authority and to go give the gospel to as many people as possible and to start the kingdom here, here in this place. We are called to make disciples. What is a disciple? It is a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. So our mission is simple. Bethel Assembly of God exists as a bridge to reach people and to help them become fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. How will we do that? We'll do that through God's values, through evangelism. We will try to save as many people as possible through outreaches, through food pantry events, through bridge events that bring us to the community rather than the community try to storm through our gates. We will do it through worship, not just through a song service, but through our everyday lives as we go and we live out the gospel and we give it to our coworkers, our family, and our friends to say, I'm not broken no more, and you don't have to be either. We will do it in fellowship. We will be a community that laughs and that cries and that loves and that holds each other up. Now let's start with this potluck because I'm hungry. <laughs> we will do it through discipleship. We will grow together in and out of the church through God's word, through our Sunday school classes, through our Bible studies, through our small group, through bearing one another's burdens. And in ministry, we will serve on teams to prepare for the growth that this church is going to have. Not, not, not if it has it, when it has it, because this church is going to grow. If you look to your neighbor, to your left and your right, you know how many new faces I've seen in this place in two months? Because God causes the growth. It is nothing that this preacher does. It is nothing that we do. We say, God, take control and he'll fill it himself. Church, are we ready? Are we ready to do this? Are we ready to take the charge and make as many disciples as possible? 1 Corinthians 9.22 says, I have become all things to all people so that by all means I might save some. And I have so many that are the some that are right outside, that walk on our doorstep, that are broken, that are hurting, that are addicted, that are dealing with things like prostitution, and single motherhood and single fatherhood. They're broken. They're broken. And we were broken. And we were hurting and we were dying. And yet we have hope. So what should we do with it? We should go give it to the world. We should go give it to the world. But we have to make the decision here. And in every part in scripture, a decision was made by what? A covenant. A promise saying that we will keep our end of the bargain. And that's why we have communion. To remember his sacrifice. To remember his sacrifice. And to be able to say, because of that sacrifice, I can be able to go and give it out to people. Deacons, would you come?